Today on What It's Like, a little bit different today, I wanted to make a real quick video breaking down the different eras of the automobile. But before we get into all of that, I just wanted to tell you that we're going to have a live show, totally live show, on Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Figured I'd make it a little bit later so everybody can join. Anyway, on to the automotive eras. So the automobile can be traced clear back to, and I know the Benz Patton motor wagon is recognized as the first car, but the first automobile goes back even further than that. 1672 is the earliest traceable self-propelled vehicle which was built for the Emperor of China. But it's important to note that that was more of a toy than an automobile. It didn't really carry anybody, but it was powered by steam and moved under its own power. A century later, Nicholas Cugnot built an experimental artillery tractor that ran off of steam. Super impractical design, but it could carry people. This period or era could be called the experimental era, but it's fair to say that experimental era could be all the eras, really. So I'm going to call this BFE, Before Eras. So starting with 1890 to 1900, this is called the Veteran Era. It's also important to note that some eras overlap with more than one name. This era can also be called the Horseless Carriage Era because essentially that's what the cars looked like. They looked like horseless carriages. There was about 30 American manufacturers in the US by 1899. Companies like Studebaker went from making wagons slash stagecoaches converted to making horseless carriages. Stanley Steamer built their first car in 1897. Packard got their start in the horseless carriage era. Baker, which was an electric car. At the turn of the last century, there was three main sources of propulsion or fuel. There was steam, electric, and gasoline. Other early fuels included, but not limited to, hybrid technology, gas and electric, even steam electric. Many believe Ferdinand Porsche was the one that invented this technology, but that's not 100% true. William Patton, made a gasoline electric rail car in 1889. In 1896, Harry Day built the Armstrong Phaeton, which featured regen braking, electric starters, 16 years before Cadillac. Ferdinand didn't build his car until 1900, but it was all wheel drive. Ethanol, coal powered, charcoal powered, diesel came in around 1920, hydrogen came in around 1966. Kerosene, natural gas, propane. If you can think of any other fuels, please list in the comment section below. There's one more that we're going to get back to later on. Moving on to 1900 to 1910, this era is known by a couple different names. Also, this terminology may just apply to the U.S. What did you guys call these different eras in different parts of the world? Anyway, this era could be called the Brass Era, Edwardian, and Antique. Cars from this era have a lot of exposed brass, hence the name Brass Era. Also, engines were built of brass. This is also the era in which the American auto business exploded, going from 30 companies in 1899 to just shy of 500 companies in 1910. Ford would introduce the Model T, the car for the everyman. William Durant founded GM. Brands like Mercer, Willis, Hotmobile, Hudson, among many others. Electric, steam, and gas. Still the most common fuels. Up next, 1920 to 1930 can be called the Vintage Era. This era, you saw the rise of companies like Chrysler. Cars went from looking like this in 1920 to looking like this by 1930. In 1920, there was roughly 7.5 million cars and trucks in the USA. The auto industry was promoting building of roads and infrastructure to actually use these cars, making travel easier. You have to remember during this time and before it, the roads were dirt roads. Think of cow passes. Cars from this time and previous eras had multiple spare wheels, not because of tire construction, but because of nails left on the road from horseshoes. And it was always better to be safe than sorry. Hence, that's why a lot of cars had four spare wheels, because you never knew how many spare wheels you'd need on your journey. During the 20s, there was tons of innovations, four-wheel hydraulic brakes, as well as four-wheel brakes. Chrysler invented a lipped 
ridged wheel, which became an industry standard. This type of wheel allowed the tire to deflate and still stay on the rim. Power steering was introduced by Pierce Arrow. Safety glass. To be fair, most companies wasn't promoting safety except for Stutz. This is also the era of the assembled car. Companies like Jordan, Moon, Windsor, Cole, among many others, used parts from other manufacturers like engines from Continental, transmissions from different companies, door handles, and just assembled the parts into cars. Next up, 1930 to 1940, pre-war and pre-war classic. And this one has different dates depending on when your country got into World War II. In America, you could say that 1930 to 1942. America entered World War II after the Pearl Harbor attack, which was December 7th, 1941. Automotive production went until January 1st of 1942, and then the government froze all automotive production. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but some could classify 1939 as the beginning of the next era. This is the era where cars really started to come in their own. By the 1930s, the car was here to stay. Companies like Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg, Hupmobile, the three P's of Prestige, Peerless, Pierce Arrow, Packard, innovations like Synchromesh Transmission, automatic chokes, built-in trunks, column shift units like pre-selector transmission like the Bendix Electric Hand, which was first used on Hudson and then passed on to Cord. First commercial use of car built-in radios. The pre-war era also hosted the Cylinder Wars. It's important to note that Packard had a twin six way before this in the teens, but this is when more and more companies started to catch on. In the early 30s, the Simple Folk brands of like Chevy and Ford had four and six cylinder engines. Luxury companies had V8, straight eights, V12, V16. In 1932, Ford would make the first affordable V8 for the masses. The market was split on overhead and flathead engine designs. Companies that used overhead valves were Buick, Chevy, Stutz, Cadillac, the V16, the first era, the first generation, I should say, of V16 was an overhead valve design. Later, they would go to a flathead design. The pre-war era was a very colorful era, but a lot of brands didn't make it because of the ripple effects of the Great Depression. Companies would merge with other brands to try to survive, and even sometimes that wasn't enough to keep them afloat. Companies like Auburn, Cord, Duesenberg, Jordan, Peerless, Pierce Arrow, among many, many others, which are all included into this video right here. When the dust settled, the only luxury company to be independently owned was Packard. Super crazy when you think about it. Next up, War Era, 1940 through 1947. This era varies depending on when your home country was involved in World War II. This era saw the rise of the Jeep. In the United States, auto production froze on January 1st of 1942. Auto parts went until February of 42. Nothing new was made until the freeze was lifted in October of 1945. Even then, the big three still used 41 to 42 dies with very minimal design changes done to those designs. 1947 Studebaker, which was the first all-new post-war car, which was introduced on April 30th, 1946. In contrast, Ford's all-new car came out in 1949. Post-war or post-war classic era from 1949 to 1960. This era could also be called the Finn era. Saw, innovation, most companies were part of the big three. Key mergers took place in 1954. Nash and Hudson merged to form one of the most overlooked, underrated companies to ever spawn God's Green Earth, AMC. On October of that same year, Packard merged with Studebaker, which Packard only merged with Studebaker to survive the decade, and the only reason they went under is because they picked the wrong partner to merge with. Studebaker wasn't 100% honest and faithful with their books and Packard essentially got catfished. Anyway, cars went from midsize to huge with fins. Cars had designers like Alex Tribulus, 
Raymond Lowy, Harley Earl, Dick Teague, Virgil Exner, two tones and tri tone colors, both inside and outside. Power everything like power windows, power seats, power vent windows, power steering, power convertible top. You could get a power steel top with a Ford Skyliner. They brought back chassis lubrication, which was a 30s option. Colorful advertising with watercolor slash realism. 50s advertisements are my personal favorite. It was also the era of gimmicks like spinner wheels, swivel seats, translucent steering wheels, clamshell hoods, which also harked back to the 30s. First found on a 1939 Hudson push button transmission. Ford was pushing safety. Chevy put spin on oil filtration on their small block V8. By 1955, everybody had a V8 option. The V8 was in, the straight eight was out. Just about everybody had overhead valve except for AMC. They were still holding on to the Flying Scotsman flathead engine design. Overdrive transmissions were a big deal. In 1955, Nash Cross Country claimed to get 32 miles to the gallon on the highway in a fuel economy run. Continental separated from Lincoln in 1956 through the 1957 model year. It was the most expensive car you could buy in America in 1956 with a price tag of $10,000. Only option being AC, which would put it up way past that. $10,000 was equivalent to $113,157.72 in the year 2023. Cadillac could not take that sitting down. So in 1957, Cadillac released the Eldorado Brome, which cost an eye-watering $13,800, which is equivalent to you spending $151,156.16 in the year 2023. Both the Continental and the Eldorado Brome were only produced for two years, 56 to 57 for the Continental, 57, 58 for the Eldorado Brome. We have to backtrack a little bit to talk about the personal luxury car era. Many people think that it started in 1955 with the introduction of the Thunderbird, but I am going to contest that. In my personal opinion, I think it started in 1951 with the Studebaker Starlight Coupe, especially when Studebaker offered a V8. Don't get me wrong, the Thunderbird is cool, but if you've ever been in a Thunderbird and a Corvette, they are very similar cars to get in and out of. You could throw in the Nash Healey, Kaiser Darren, Jaguar XK, 120. They're all roughly around the same type of car. They're more of a sports car than they are a personal luxury car. The Studebaker doesn't compromise anything. Also, in my opinion, the best personal luxury car of the 50s is the Golden Hawk because it doesn't compromise anything. You got plenty of space in the front, plenty of space to get in, and that's kind of what a personal luxury car is, right? The personal luxury car era would peak in the mid 60s into the 70s with cars like the GT Hawk, Buick Riviera, Old Tornado, Ford Thunderbird, Lincoln Mark Series, Cadillac Eldorado, some will say that this era is still around. They do still make personal luxury cars, but to me, the personal luxury car segment died when the Lincoln Mark series died because that was their clientele. That's who they sold cars to, people that wanted a personal luxury experience. The muscle car era, 1949 to 1972, question mark. This one is a bit harder to give an actual time frame because there was cars before the Olds Rocket 88 that could be considered muscle cars like the Mercer Raceabout or the Duesenberg, but the Duesenberg was a huge car and muscle car means different things to different people. Many will say the muscle car era is from 1964 to 1972, but if that's the case, you leave out the 1957 Rambler Rebel, which was one of the fastest cars of the 50s. Studebaker Golden Hawk, which is technically a personal luxury car. The original Corvette could also be, in, it's in a gray area, really. 1962 Plymouth Savoy, I would say, is a muscle car with a big 413 wedge V8. Pony car era, 1964 through 1973. This is where things get complicated. Pony cars are smaller, like the Mustang, Camaro, Firebird, Javelin, AMX, Would You, Barracuda, and possibly the Marlin. 
It's possible for pony cars to become muscle cars, but muscle cars aren't pony cars. Muscle cars were bigger like the GTO, Chevelle, 442, Torino, Galaxy, Roadrunner, GTX, among many others. It's also worth mentioning from 1960 to 1977, that is also called the classic era. In 1973, U.S. federal government released several mandates to reduce pollution, also wanted to improve safety and fuel economy, ushering in a new era called the Malaise Era, which lasted from 1973 to 1983. All of those regulations would be the death blow to the muscle car era. It's also worth mentioning they changed the way we measure horsepower figures around 1971 or 1972. Automakers began using SAE net instead of brake horsepower, which was also called SAE gross horsepower. The brake horsepower figure was measured according to the Society of Automotive Engineers. That's what S. AE stands for, they would test engines without accessories, like they would run the engines without water pumps, fans, alternators, generators, to give a perfect world number. Some were fitted with long tube headers instead of exhaust. Also important to note, it does not take into account for transmission loss of power. S AE net is measured at the crankshaft with accessories hooked up, so rating is more real world figures instead of perfect world figures. Hot hatchback era, 1970s to present. It's important to note the hatchback was around much longer, like Kaiser Traveler was a hatchback, but hot hatchbacks use small displacement engines generally and a manual transmission for best experience. Cars like the Toyota Celica, Honda Civic, Volkswagen GTI, AMC Gremlin, Mini Cooper, Renault Alpine, Lancia, among others. This era saw a rebirth, not that it ever really went away, it just got more interesting in 2014 with the Golf R, Veloster, R-Spec Turbo, which was the only new car that I ever purchased. Volkswagen GTI, Ford Focus RS, Ford, Fiesta ST, Mercedes, A45, as well as many others. This era is kind of sort of still around, but it's more or less in the background. The start of the modern era, in my opinion, was 1977 when GM put the first ECU in a car, Oldsmobile Tornado, with its single function for electronic spark timing. The modern era would see more and more plastics, the rise of the Chrysler K car, the fall of AMC, Chrysler buyout of AMC for Jeep and their all-wheel drive system. Automatic seatbelts, Chrysler cars telling you that door is ajar. In 1997, to present with the birth of the Toyota Prius. And I know I own a Toyota Prius, but it's an appliance car. I call this the appliance era. Doesn't have any gauges for anything, but has idiot lights. The only gauges are for the speed and fuel. Digital display with screens. Not all cars from 1997 are at this level of appliance, but I will say appliances really did start in the 2010s. Cars are just built so cheaply and cost a premium now. Most all new cars have screens. It's like a battle of the screens. The new Grand Wagoneer has like 13 screens. 2010 saw the rise of piano black plastics as the luxury material. People might get mad at the appliance comments, but let's be real, when cars break, it costs a fortune to fix it because of electronics, microchip shortages. It's easier and cheaper just to get a new car, and that is by design. Car companies don't make money when you don't trade in or sell your car. If you keep your car forever, they lose money. The powertrain warranties reflect that. Three year, 36,000 miles on everything. Five year powertrain, 60,000 miles. Other reasons I think we are living in the appliance era now is when you can make your car better via software update. That's an appliance. The cars today are more smartphone than actual car. When you have to plug a computer into it to find out what's wrong with it, that's an appliance. And don't get me wrong, they make great appliance cars. They just will never be machines. You will always feel isolated from the driving experience because you're not really driving the car. With ABS and traction control and all the driver assists, as well as rev limiters and rev matching, 
there is so much software that is doing all of the hard stuff for you, and that's what I meant by that. Anyway, now it's time for Would You Rather. Different scenario today. In the comment section, put what your favorite eras are. And I rarely do this, but I'm going to share what my two favorite eras are. I love the 30s and the 50s. So much innovation in those two eras, Fenders and Fins. On to name that tune. First person to get both the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. Bit of a curveball there, but anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. If you don't have Facebook and would still like to reach me, send me an email, all of which will be linked in the description below. Just know I really do appreciate everything that you guys bring in the comment section. And until next time, toodaloo! Louie, Louie. Oh, baby, now we gotta go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Louie, Louie. Oh, no, we gotta go.